I think that if you made a word cloud for today, FinCEN would probably rank up there with everything else. Which is why it's fantastic that our final speaker for tonight is Jennifer Shasky Calvary, who is the director of the Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Previously, she worked at the Department of Justice, where she served as the chief of the Asset Forfeiture and Money Laundering Section, and where much of her work focused on combating criminal financial schemes. Welcome. All right, I have the unenviable position of being the last one up and being the one that's keeping you from hopefully going and enjoying um, maybe an early happy hour somewhere. But uh, uh, I'd like to thank our, our previous panelists because I, I, as I've sat here just through the afternoon panels, um, it's it's been a great conversation and, and one that I think was a, uh, one of the more educated and, and interesting uh, conversations I've heard on this topic and, and coming from a multitude of directions. So I'll try not to lower the bar here. Uh, I am, however, going to start with some prepared remarks. I think people at the Department of Treasury are a little scared to let me just speak on my own uh, in an unscripted format. Never know what, what that Shasky, the former prosecutor, might say. So uh, I'm going to start with some prepared remarks, but then go to the unscripted uh, side on a, on a Q&A, which I'm, I'm looking forward to. So uh, let me start with this. First of all, uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, I'd like to take a few minutes to set the stage on how FinCEN and this country's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing regulator has been approaching the issue of virtual currency, as well as some developments that we've been observing as the industry continues to take shape, much of which has already been discussed this afternoon. Uh, because any financial institution payment system or medium of exchange has the potential to be exploited for money laundering, fighting such illicit use requires consistent regulation across the financial system. Virtual currency is no different from other financial products and services in this regard. What is important is that financial institutions that deal in virtual currency put effective AML CFT controls in place to harden themselves from becoming the targets of illicit actors that would exploit their vulnerabilities. And I'm sorry, I use virtual currency and I've been told by others that I should be using digital currency, but since our, our uh, regulations speak in virtual currency, I'm gonna stick with that and, and we can debate this in the future whether we need to change it to digital currency. Uh, to help in this regard, FinCEN issued interpretive guidance last March, which has been discussed widely today, uh, to bring clarity and regulatory certainty for businesses and individuals engaged in money transmitting services and offering, offering virtual currencies. In the simplest of terms, FinCEN's guidance explains that administrators or exchangers of virtual currencies must, must register with FinCEN and institute certain record keeping, reporting, and AML program control measures unless an exception to these requirements applies. The guidance also explains that those who use virtual currencies exclusively for common personal transactions, like buying goods or services online or buying pizza or living for a week on, on Bitcoin in San Francisco, are users and not subject to regulatory requirements under the BSA. In all cases, FinCEN employs an activity-based test to determine when someone dealing with virtual currency qualifies as a money transmitter. The guidance clarifies definitions and expectations to ensure that businesses engaged in such activities are aware of their regulatory responsibilities, including registering appropriately. Furthermore, FinCEN closely coordinates with its state regulatory counterparts, such as Ben Losky in New York, to encourage appropriate application of FinCEN guidance as part of the state's separate AML compliance oversight of financial institutions. Also to expand upon our March 2013 guidance, FinCEN issued two administrative rulings just this last month on January 30th. The rulings provided additional information on our regulatory coverage of certain activities related to convertible virtual currency. In both rulings, the convertible virtual currency at issue was the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. The first ruling states that to the extent a user creates or mines a convertible virtual currency solar, solely for a user's own purposes, the user is not a money transmitter. The second states that a company purchasing and selling convertible virtual currency as an investment exclusively for the company's benefit is not a money transmitter. Since our March 2013 guidance was issued, 
Many of the questions we've received have been about the applicability of our regulations to users of convertible virtual currency, and in particular Bitcoin. We're hopeful that these rulings will help to provide clarity in this area. I'm pleased to report that some virtual currency exchangers have registered with FinCEN since the issuance of last year's guidance. Uh, I do, however, remain concerned that there appear to be many domestic virtual currency exchangers that have not taken this step. FinCEN has been engaged in an outreach effort to virtual currency exchangers that have a domestic presence to outline the regulatory requirements and to offer assistance on the registration process. And if a business does not believe it is required to register, we're asking it to contact FinCEN so we can gather additional information in order to make a conclusive determination. Since our outreach efforts began, we've continued to see a steady increase in the number of virtual currency exchangers registering with FinCEN. As the Financial Intelligence Unit for the United States, FinCEN must stay current on how money is being laundered in the United States, including through new and emerging payment systems. So that we can share this expertise with our many law enforcement, regulatory, industry, and foreign Financial Intelligence Unit partners, and effectively serve as the cornerstone of this country's AML-CFT regime. FinCEN has certainly sought to meet this responsibility with regard to virtual currency and its exploitation by illicit actors. In addition to our efforts on the regulatory side, FinCEN's analysts are working hard to stay ahead of the curve in understanding emerging payment systems and related financial flows, including how they're exploited by bad actors, and to put that information into the hands of our law enforcement and regulatory customers who need it most. Virtual currencies are a financial service, and virtual currency administrators and exchangers are financial institutions under our regulations. Any financial institution and any financial service could be exploited for money laundering purposes. What is important is for institutions to put controls in place to deal with those money laundering threats and to meet their AML reporting obligations. FinCEN's main goal is to ensure the integrity and transparency of the U.S. financial system so that money laundering and terrorist financing can be prevented and where it does occur, be detected for follow-on action. Every financial institution needs to be concerned about its reputation and to go out of its way to show it is operating within the transparency and integrity within the bounds of the law. And it is in the area of transparency where some of our more recent concerns arise, and some of which I think were brought up by the last panel. Uh, Liberty Reserve, uh, a web-based virtual currency known to most in this room, I think, was one of our earliest concerns that resulted in a criminal indictment, of course, by the U.S. Department of Justice, as well as a 311 action by FinCEN under the USA Patriot Act. FinCEN designated Liberty Reserve as a financial institution of primary money laundering concern in May of 2013, the first use of Section 311 authorities by FinCEN against a virtual currency provider. Liberty Reserve was widely used at the time by criminals around the world to store, transfer, and launder the proceeds of their illicit activities. Liberty Reserve's virtual currency had become a preferred method of payment on websites dedicated to the promotion and facilitation of illicit web-based activity, including identity fraud, credit card theft, online scams, and dissemination of computer malware, um, and some of the child exploitation that I think folks mentioned earlier. It sought to avoid regulatory scrutiny while tailoring its services, services specifically to illicit actors. More recent concerns include the use of Bitcoin on Silk Road and the dark net, which led to a major money laundering indictment discussed again here earlier. Recent allegations that the compliance officer at a registered Bitcoin exchanger engaged in money laundering conspiracy involving the sale of drugs on the Silk Road. And reports that new companies and cryptocurrencies are being established with a stated goal of reducing transparency. However, on a more positive note, we're also starting to see instances where the virtual currency industry is taking steps to increase transparency in this space. In addition to registering with FinCEN, some virtual currency exchanges are beginning to comply with reporting requirements and are filing suspicious activity reports with FinCENs. Suspicious activity reports, or SARS, are just what they sound like, the report of suspicious transactions. While the dollar threshold differs slightly by industry, if a money transmitter knows, suspects, or has reason to suspect that any transaction or attempted transaction is suspicious and the transaction or attempted transaction involves or aggregates to funds of $2,000 worth $2,000 uh, or more, a SAR is required. 
It's encouraging to see some players in the virtual currency industry taking their responsibilities seriously. Legitimate financial institutions, including virtual currency providers, do not go into business with the aim of laundering money on behalf of criminals. And legitimate customers will be drawn to virtual currency or administrators or exchangers where they know their money's safe and where they know the company has a reputation for integrity. Our discussion here today, as well as what we've seen transpire in the last year, illustrate that virtual currency industry has reached a crossroads. And when you come to a crossroads, you need to decide which way you're going to turn. Will it be transparency, integrity, and legitimacy? Or will it be shadows, criminality, and the risk, like a liberty reserve, of extin extinction? When I spoke on this issue several months ago, I closed with a challenge to our great innovators, which I think Chip may have just repeated here today, which is I asked them to extend their focus and devise creative solutions for preventing the abuse of virtual currencies by criminals. That challenge remains, and perhaps with even greater urgency, today. I think we can all agree that the stakes are too high for both the industry and the government to allow virtual currency systems to be used by bad actors. FinCEN will continue to draw from the knowledge we've gained through our regulatory efforts, use of targeted financial measures, analysis of the financial intelligence we collect, independent study of virtual currency, outreach to industry, and collaboration with our many partners in law enforcement to protect the integrity and transparency of the U.S. financial system. And with that, let the questions begin. So I'll turn it to you, buddy. Before I'll start with one question, and then we'll pass the mic around. I'll ask the elephant in the room question, because this may be the only room where we've got uh, Jennifer Shastri and Matt Green sitting within uh, uh, five or six feet of each other. So my, qu my question is, um, to the extent that you're willing to say anything, what would you think about something like ZeroCoin, which literally removes any traceability to the identity of people doing transactions? So I, I think the last panel alluded to this, to this issue, and, it, and we started down the road of talking about this, the, the policy issue at stake. Um, and of course, at FinCEN, what we care about is protecting the U.S. financial system from money laundering and terrorist finance. So that's, that's our angle of how we look at this, and this is what we're regulating for. And so our rules are designed to do a couple things. One is to prevent uh, uh, dirty money from coming into the U.S. financial system. That's one thing we try to, to do. The other is to report on it when we think it's in there. And so there's always kind of a sliding scale of, of, of trying to, to have a balance between those two things. Um, but another thing we're trying to balance is privacy, the very real and of, of, uh, issue of individual privacy, data privacy, privacy in your transactions, with the also very real need to have some level of transparency to prevent the abuse of the U.S. financial system by illicit actors. And so it, it's where exactly on that spectrum we should be is the policy question um, that I think everyone's trying to, to come to grips with. Uh, it's an issue that I know is being discussed this very week at the Financial Action Task Force, which is the international standard setting body for anti-money laundering and terrorist finance. Uh, different countries have different perspectives on how they look at data privacy versus, versus needing to protect the nation from illicit actors. Uh, different things happen in history to change where folks think that balance needs to be. Um, obviously, after 9-11, we felt one way, and that kind of that spectrum, or that it's probably a sliding kind of scale on, on how you feel over the course of history and in given years. But at this point, where we are in this country is seeking a certain level of transparency around financial activity in this country. Um, and I guess I would take there was a comment earlier kind of uh, comparing the BSA and, and, and maybe confusing it a little bit with NSA um, and what they do. So let me, let me try to <laughs> pull that back apart. Um, so the, I think when we were talking about revelations in the last year that have, have come up through, through releases of NSA information and Snowden and, and other things, um, we're talking about an issue in this country of was there a collection of information that the public didn't know about and that the public disagrees with and thinks is, and it goes too far on the data privacy side in the wrong direction. 
Um, that is very different than the Bank Secrecy Act, which is um, a public statute. Uh, what is collected is on our website. Um, you can see every single piece of information that is collected under the BSA regime. Every time there's a thought that we might collect some new type of information uh, or extend uh, the collection, that's done through a public rulemaking process. Uh, uh, most recent, recently when CHIP was in the government uh, thinking about beneficial ownership and, and whether we needed to collect more information on that, he did a city to city tour uh, asking people in the, of the public to come in be part of hearings and to comment on whether this was a good idea. That's a very different situation, I think, um, when you start talking about what's happening in the BSA public rulemaking space versus what's happening perhaps in the intelligence community. Um, both have different roles, but they also have very different ways of doing business. Thank you very much. So perhaps uh, some questions. Um, is, I don't know who's got the microphone. Um, I saw Jim Harper raising his hand first, but I don't know if the microphone is around. As the microphone seems to be gone, so perhaps I don't want to hold the program up. So, oh, there we go. Here, the microphone has has arrived. Okay. Uh, point well made that the BSA and the NSA are different things. I, and I just wanted to, <laughs> I just wanted to clarify that a little bit because I because I touched on it only very briefly. Uh, a pair of cases after the passage of the Bank Secrecy Act in the early 1970s uh, created the legal doctrine that the National Security Agency uses to um, as its basis for collecting. Uh, data about all our telephone calls. So the California bankers case in U.S. versus Miller were precedents that under underlay Smith versus Maryland, which is the telephone records case. I think I just wanted to clarify that, that uh, no confusion about the two. I won't ask whether you can confirm that the NSA does not collect <laughs> financial information. I would refer information. you to the National Security Agency. <laughs> that, we'll, we'll try to take that up with them. Okay, so next, uh, I guess, uh, go Jerry, we have a question here. Uh, Jerry Brito up here. Um, so recently, two men were arrested in Miami, uh, charged with violating Florida's uh, money transmission laws. Um, and apparently they met them, each other on local bitcoins, uh, which is not necessarily an exchange, but it's a site that allows, it's a forum where people can speak and find each other. Um, how would Vincent's guidance or the BSA uh, apply? Sure. And what's your general thoughts on, on that case? So uh, my general thoughts, because great, that's where I was going to start. So my general thoughts are, um, that that might just be an example of where our AML regime is working, right? Um, so you're always gonna have, uh, mentioned I think in the prepared remarks that any financial institution, any financial service can be exploited by bad actors. Uh, I think we've seen through the test of time, it, it is, <laughs> they all are at some point exploited by bad actors. And so the whole point of the AML regime is to try to mitigate those risks and to um, you know, uh, respond to uh, those risks when they do occur. So uh, to me, in a general sense, this is us seeing our AML regime in this country at the federal level and at the state level working. Um, in terms of how we would treat those same individuals under our rules, we have a fact and circumstances kind of test for every situation. So this is where I give you the really wormy answer of it depends on the facts and circumstances. Um, but it is in fact true. Uh, but let me give you an example that uh, we have a, a, a great analyst who's really into cryptocurrencies and um, knows them really well, follows everything. And we were having a chat uh, yesterday about you know the dealers that you know uh, advertise that if you want to buy bitcoins, meet me in the local Starbucks, give me your cash, I'll give you bitcoins, um, and would that be an exchanger under our rules? And then we got into a debate, because we're really geeky at FinCEN, but we did. Um, there was a whole room full of us debating this issue. Um, and I think the, the common belief for us is, yeah, uh, because essentially you're taking money from the public, kind of at large, and giving them value in return or something that uh, uh, substitutes for value, which is Bitcoin. So under that circumstance, that person would be required to register as a money transmitter with FinCEN. I'm sorry, the... The forum, uh, so the website at which these um, exchangers find each other, the website just merely facilitates speaking. So are you asking whether they would register the website or themselves personally? They would have to register the business, whatever that is, and so we would get into a discussion with them of, of how they're organized and, and what that would be. Okay, so I think I've got, I saw Carter, then I saw Carol, then I saw Kashmir, and I don't know where we'll, we might run out of time after that, but let's, 
Yeah, just to follow on on that uh, Florida case, because that, that's a really interesting one. And uh, I shouldn't have been surprised that there are special money laundering laws in uh, Florida, but I was. Uh, I remember Miami Vice. And, uh, but it, it did raise the interesting question of uh, what is FinCEN's sort of policy on how you view uh, extra layered on state laws or regulations? Do, do you encourage them? They exist in some states, they exist in others mostly as criminal statutes, as I understand, but not as banking regulations. Most of the states just say comply with FinCEN rules. So every state's got some uh, level of its own laws and regulations and licensing um, requirements for financial institutions. And those, they aren't all exactly the same, which is part of the rub that um, folks find it difficult to navigate. Uh, but every state's got something, and they, they all cover banks in one way or another. And then when you get into the non-bank financial institutions, is, which is where we're finding um, virtual currency or digital currency, uh, how they're covered depends. I think we heard Ben Losky today say that he thinks New York's going to go in the direction of defining this under their money transmitter laws or laws yet to be determined like we have at the federal level. Um, so this is just, we know this exists. Uh, it's not that uncommon. Uh, it's, it's true in this space, but it's true in any number of business spaces, criminal law spaces, where you have both state law and federal law that apply and have concurrent and overlapping jurisdictions. Uh, what we try to do to deal with that, to keep the burden as, as low as possible on business and to have consistency in w the way we give a regulatory approach is to work as closely with the states as we can. There's something called the Conference of State Bank Supervisors, which is where all the state uh, regulators belong to. And, and they come together and try amongst themselves to have some commonality. They're engaging in more and more joint uh, state examination. So if there's a uh, entity that operates and is licensed in more than one state, you might think of it in a money transmitter, uh, like a, a more traditional money transmitter, like a Western Union or MoneyGram or something like that that's in for every state, I think. Um, several states will come together and do a joint exam together to give that consistency. FinCEN will, will, has started going in on some of those ourselves as well to give that federal to state consistency. Um, there's probably more work we can be doing, but it's an, an issue that uh, both the states and at the federal lev level we take seriously. Thank you. So a good Carol, I think, and then we had Kashmir, and then I've got. got Thank you. Um, the interpretive guidance last March, a year ago, um, seemed to affirm the position the Department of Justice had taken in the prosecution of the Eagle case back in 2007, 2008. Uh, and at that time, the declaration was that it was a money transmitter and a, uh, a money MSB for uh, BSA purposes. Um, there were letters that were written in conjunction with the rewrite of the, of the MSB regulation in 2009 or 10, and then again with the prepaid regulation, encouraging that maybe a new category of MSB be created for digital currencies or virtual currencies. Um, as you start to deconstruct what goes on in the digital virtual currency world, there really are multiple types of functions. And I know that the guidance that you put out made it clear that you weren't doing currency, uh, it, that, that it wasn't currency exchange, because currency exchange was, was defined to be fiat currency. Um, are you giving any kind of thought of looking at that there is a currency exchange function and possibly rewriting the definition of currency exchange to accommodate that? Um, and then looking at the, the second piece of it of what really constitutes money transmission and possibly even reinstating the concept of stored value when you start talking about digital wallets where value is held. Um, as I said, there at least three or four different things that are going on here. Sure, so we considered, uh, and Jim can tell you because he was director of FinCEN at the time, um, so we, i.e. him, and the people working for him at the time, considered all of those issues as I understand it and, and, and purposely went in the direction where we are, which, and we're pretty comfortable with it. Let me explain what that is, why we're comfortable with it, and how we got there in a moment. Um, but to, just to go back to the Eagle 2007-2008 timeframe, one thing that would have set that apart from where we are today, there's probably a couple things. Um, back then, to, to, to charge someone with the legal uh, money transmitting business, 
uh, prosecutors were using the state law. So when we talk about federal and state law, um, there was not yet the fully, uh, as I, I don't think yet at that time, we had the fully, uh, the registration process in place yet at FinCEN. And so most of those illegal money transmitting cases were brought using state law. Uh, since that time, we now have the registration process in place at the federal level. It's pretty streamlined. Uh, there's no cost to it. Um, so uh, businesses are tending to go that way and, and uh, prosecutions are tending to rely more on the federal system at this point. Um, maybe more of a, a nuanced detail than, than important. Uh, in terms of why did we go the way we did in terms of defining virtual currency exchangers and administrators under the money transmitting law. So before the uh, guidance in March of last year, yes, last year, um, about a year or two previous to that, uh, there was a change in the rules to change the definition of money transmission. And that was done purposely with the idea of emerging payment methods that were already being, uh, we saw them in the marketplace, we knew there was more coming, and wanted there to be some flexibility around how we would define the transmission, not just of fiat currency, but other things of value. And I always write it down because I can never remember the exact construction, but I think it's other value that substitutes for currency. So that was the phrase that was added into the rule for money transmitter that would give us a certain amount of flexibility that as things develop, as things change, we could throw it into the pre-existing rules. Um, the reason that that's important to us is because it gives a level playing field, right? There's all kinds of types of financial institutions out there, all types of financial services. Generally, we're looking for them to have the same principles in place to protect the U.S. financial system. Reporting requirements, um, AML program controls to prevent dirty money from coming into the system, uh, and we wanted them to get into that pre-existing regulatory environment that all other institutions use, all other services are a part of that. Um, at the end of the day, if, if there's a change and all of a sudden uh, Bitcoin is thought of as a commodity, quite frankly, it's going to have many of the, the very same AML regulatory requirements. So it's a little bit apples orange, you know, who cares at the end of the day, as long as we've mitigated the risks, as long as we've got the controls in place. I think we have time for one more question. I think Kashmir Hill had, had her hand up. So. You, uh, you have Bitcoin companies that are starting to register. I was wondering if you have any other virtual currency companies that are registering. And then um, you said they are starting to file SAR suspicious activity reports. And I was just curious how those compare to SARs that you would get from a, a, a normal uh, money exchanger. The, our people rave about how uh, great the SARs are and how well written and, and how useful. So, um, uh, I. It's not many at this point, quite frankly. It's still pretty low uh, in terms of uh, the number of, we do have different virtual currency uh, exchangers and administrators that have registered with us. It's not just Bitcoin. Um, our, my folks tell me that we're up to over 400 different types of cryptocurrencies at this point worldwide. So um, there's a lot out there. Uh, and uh, we're getting registrations from different folks. Um, but overall, from what I'm hearing, uh, when we, the companies that are filing SARS know what they're doing and they're doing a great job of it. Great. Okay. So we're uh, about out of time, but we should thank uh, Jennifer Shastri for a really interesting thing. <laughs>